Hello and welcome to Inspiration Plus, an inspirational and educational program for people who want to live a significant, purposeful and fulfilled life. Our guest this week is a very passionate and fabulous young woman who is the founder and CEO of Diversity Focus. Her company provides diversity training, consulting, and research to government, not-for-profit, private, and tertiary education sectors. In line with her passion in prevention and early intervention, she is currently completing her PhD research at Curtin University titled Conceptualizing Domestic and Family Violence in the Frame of Collectivist Cultures, seeking to broaden the current socio-cultural conception of what constitutes domestic and family violence. She's also a sessional academic at Curtin University. She has lectured and tutored a range of multidisciplinary units in the School of Occupational Therapy, Social Work, and Speech Pathology since 2015. She also serves on the board of the Organization of African Communities, OAC, in WA, as the Vice President Operations and the WA Police Multicultural Women's Advisory Group. She is the author of Wired for Bias and a second upcoming book, Bridging the Cultural Divide, leveraging, and leveraging the benefits of diversity in teams. She's a passionate human rights advocate and has presented on a number of national and international platforms, including the UNHCR, HCR in Geneva, Switzerland, Originally from South Sudan, she has lived in Australia since arriving in 1998. She is a mother of two and enjoys traveling, reading, and decorating. Elizabeth Lang, thanks for joining us this morning. It's an honor to have you on Inspiration Plus. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be um, chatting with you this morning. So thank you. incredible woman with such a powerful and inspirational story you know um, how did you find yourself working in the diversity and inclusion space uh, I found myself in the space it was sort of through I guess a collection of life experiences that I think led me to this path um, I wouldn't say that I necessarily growing up had this idea that I was going to be, you know, running a company and, and working in the space. Uh, but I sort of navigated working through community development initially. I worked with young people. Um, then I moved into research. I did some work around community education and awareness, particularly in domestic and family violence. Uh, and then I moved into other roles around training um, for, a, I guess, a range of topics. Um, diversity and inclusion being one of them. Uh, and I guess through that pathway, through that journey, I've seen how there's such a lack of knowledge and such a lack of understanding um, concerning topics of diversity and inclusion. And that led me to want to create um, work or to create a space where I could um, be engaged in those dialogues and provide a different perspective. Because I also saw that a lot of diversity and inclusion uh, practitioners were sort of working from a perspective, it's very theory based um, and I feel like people don't learn, you, you need a combination of theory but also you need a combination of practice and I think you can never underestimate the power of the lived experience. Um, so as a woman of colour, I guess I, I know that I have a perspective that is quite unique uh, and so yeah I sort of embarked on that and, and in the hope that by contributing to that conversation that I could hopefully um, help to make some kind of a shift. So, yeah. Wow, interesting. And I like the fact that you really needed to, you know, as a woman of color, you also needed to bring 
to the table, your perspective. And that's very important because so oftentimes you find you have people who represent us who don't really know much of our stories, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, people, yeah. Speak, people speak for us based on what they've read or what they think they understand. Mm, um, mm, and that's very different. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Very totally different from lived experiences. Yeah, all right. So now you, you, you came to Australia as a child, is that right? And you came to Australia as a child. And how is it like for you growing up here? Um, it was, I guess it was, it was interesting. Um, when we came, we initially lived in Sydney. So we spent, uh, I think the, the first eight years I spent in Sydney before I moved to Perth. Um, so in 98, we, we settled in Sydney. Um, and at the time, I mean, growing up, it's, it's interesting to reflect because, you know, as a child, you, you have experiences that you don't necessarily understand or can't make sense of, but you just have to make do with the situation that you find yourself in. Yes. Um, growing up in Sydney, yeah, it was, I mean, I, I went to school and, but even when I think of my early days in school, the, the primary school that I was initially, uh, that I spent most of my time in was sort of, I think it was the first time they had black African kids and we were somewhat of an anomaly and we were seen as like this, you know, unique and interesting. And I think both from the students and the teachers, I also didn't speak English um, and my siblings didn't. So I, I was learning English at the age of around 10, um, which I guess as a child didn't take too long. You, you sort of pick up the language a lot quicker when you're younger. But yeah, it was, it was an interesting experience to sort of find myself in a situation where I was seen as, some, as someone that was very different. Um, but in saying that, I, I guess I, I was able to make friends and, 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 and I think that's the beauty of children. They see past a lot of things and they find reasons why you should be friends. You know, we like the same color or we, we watch the same cartoon or what have you. Um, so I was able to connect in that way. But I think more broadly speaking, from the societal perspective, it probably didn't feel as welcoming. And I don't think for my parents, it felt as welcoming. I think that, that, that often you have reminders that you don't belong. And wh whether those reminders are deliberate, people actually deliberately trying to exclude you and make you feel like you don't belong, or whether it's just by virtue of the fact that you're a minority and you're not represented anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, that, that was interesting. Yeah, no, and I can really... Um resonate with what you are saying because I know I must really acknowledge and admit that things have changed a bit here. Um, Australia has become more, it's, it's slowly becoming inclusive and, 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 and I mean it takes a lot of work and intentionality uh, on everyone's part but I can only imagine when you, you know, maybe 10 or so years ago, even maybe 20 years ago, when many people, especially people of color, were coming here, were arriving here, how the experience would have been for, um, for them. The good thing is what we can celebrate is we are heading in the right direction. Yeah, that's true. And as parents, it's our duty to teach and guide our children um, in terms of how they ought to treat one another. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, how they ought to treat people who look different. And, mm. and, and, I, and, and, and I think for me, it's really my point of um, teaching for my children is that you should, you, should, you should be curious and let your curiosity, you know, lead you to want to know more about the person who looks different to you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. All right, moving on to something totally... I shouldn't say totally different because I think it's all connected somehow. Um, looking at what you have, you know, looking at your biography, oh my God, what an amazing and phenomenal woman you are. You know, the first time I met you, I was like, wow, who is this woman who is so eloquent in speech, very smooth. And, you know, I was like, the African CCA is so proud of you, you know, very, very humble and still um, confident in, 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 in what you are able to do. And, and yeah, no, we, 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 you, you, you really, 
um, impressed me, I should say, by, by your, your, your character, how you handle yourself. So looking at what you have achieved so far, which is really, really amazing, um, what has been your driving force and how have you managed to overcome the challenges you faced? Okay. Um, I guess my driving force, it's probably changes I've grown up, but um, I think it started with, with my mom. I grew up with a, a quite a strict mother. <laughs> um, and, I think, and I think growing up, it was difficult for me because I, you know, as a child, I felt like she wasn't fair. She was just trying to ruin my life, you know, as a teenager. Um, but as I grew up, I started to, and, and particularly now that I'm a mother myself now, I wouldn't necessarily mother in, with, with the same level of <laughs> restrictions, I think, but I, I've definitely come to appreciate that she had a huge impact on my life um, in terms of just, uh, I guess, helping to position me in, 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 in a place where I'm quite intentional and serious about what I do with my time, how I invest my time, etc. Uh, so I think that that, that that has been a huge part of it. But my overall motivation, and, and again, like I said, it, it, it changes because before I had my kids, you know, I had other motivations where maybe it was a little bit uh, based on wanting to make my dreams come true. Not that that has changed, but I have something else now that is a driving factor, a motivating factor, because uh, my children are, I think, my biggest achievement. Um, because you know, I've created two little people who I have tremendous, uh, I guess, authority over in terms of how they grow up. So that is a, a huge part of what motivates me. But I think, generally speaking, if I was to remove all those other factors. I would just generally say that what really motivates me to live with intention and to be driven and have a desire to do everything I want to achieve is just the fact that this earthly life, you only get one of it. Um, and once you're gone, you're gone. Um, and I strongly believe that each person was created for a purpose. Uh, I strongly believe that we all have different gifts that God has created us with with the intention that we manifest those gifts while we're here. So I think that that's my biggest motivating factor. Cause I go, you know, I have, there's things that God has put within me. There's gifts that God has put within me and desires. Um, and I have a responsibility to manifest all those desires and those gifts before I check out of this place. And if I fail to do that, then I've technically failed myself. So broadly speaking, I think that that's what motivates me more than anything else. And then there's, there's the other factors of obviously wanting to um, make a positive change in, in society, both in Australia, but also globally, um, et cetera. Um, I guess the, the passion for justice and for peace is also, uh, also other elements that, that are a driving factor. But I think overall, it's just the desire to, yeah, to just, to, to, to be who I think I was created to be, because uh, I strongly believe that also, and I think that th this obviously applies to everybody, when we all operate from a place where we give of ourselves in terms of, of our desires or the things that I believe God has put within us, I believe that it brings us a level of harmony in the world because we're all interconnected in some ways and the manifestation of each person's gift is the blessing for somebody else. I am blessed by other people's gifts in the same manner that my gifts are, are a blessing to others. So I know there was a part two to that question. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's okay. We can, you know, I, I am going to, you know, interrupt you there and, and, and I'm sorry because I'm so excited and really I'm one person who is a strong believer in us utilizing and using our gifts for the benefits of of you know of the for the benefit of the world and, and and others right and you have touched on a very very important aspect there where you say we have all come you know come on you know come to the planet come to earth yeah. you know with caring gifts and these gifts are meant to be used 
for the betterment of the world. I'm reminded of the late Dr. Miles Monroe. I used to be a very, very, you know, like a, a fan of, of, of him. How, you know, when he, in one of his books, he said, the graveyard or the cemetery is the richest place um, on earth because so many people have died. Many, many people have died full not empty, full, yeah. they've not utilized or they've not used their gifts to mm. benefit others or for the betterment of the world. And I was like, wow, that really struck a chord with me. And from that time onwards, I became very passionate about purposeful living. No wonder we have this, you know, hence why we have this platform, this program, Inspiration Plus, for us to live um, on purpose, and also strive to live a significant life. And so that's very, very important. And, and, and that's why I think I fell in love with, with your work and you as a person when I met you, because you are such an intention, um, an intentional and purposeful person, you know, the life that you live. And you live it with such humility. Um, and, and, and you talk of harmony as well, you know, you, you spoke about, you mentioned harmony when we are operating from a place of, um, our, you know, place of strength or place of gifting, we bring this harmony into the world. And I think it also eliminates envy and jealousy. Yeah. A lot of problems a lot of problems we are having at the moment or experiencing in the world are as a result of jealousy and envy <laughs> you know so if we can all understand and operate from a place of gifting and passion then we are not going to be jealous of another person instead we will elevate them and we will complement each other Exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. Going on to the second part of the question, um, we really want to know how you have managed to overcome the challenges you 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 faced. Because I know in trying to um, work hard, achieve your goals, or you know, achieve your vision, you would have encountered a lot of you know. I can't say a lot. I can speak for you, but you would have encountered some challenges and so what we want to know if you are able to invite us into your world a little bit and talk to us about the challenges you faced and how you were able to overcome them thank you um i think you're right in saying that that you know i i have faced challenges i think as everybody does when you're embarking on a journey and and wanting to, to live a purposeful life or pursue your dreams or what have you. Um, those challenges are, are both personal, but they're also, I guess that there's some internal challenges in terms of personal, the practicality of being a mother and, it, and a wife, etc. But there are also broader challenges that maybe are a little bit beyond my control to some degree. Um, so challenges, um, I guess, outside of, of the personal space, um, would be things like the fact that um, as a woman of color, some, not sometimes, often, people will underestimate your ability, your capacity, your intelligence, or, or, or people might just have to, not have to, but people sometimes will question. And, and, and I think for a lot of people, they do it without even realizing that they have certain biases that are driving how they're talking to someone or how uh, they're presenting to that person. So... And those challenges, I think, will, will always be there. And, and I think as the years go on, things have gotten better. They continue to get better. Um, but you will always be faced with, 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 with external challenges. And I guess the way that I've been able to address them is I don't take things personally. Um, I realize, and I think that that comes with, with maturity and growing up as well, that you start to realize that it, you know, it's not all about you. And, and sometimes people's people's issues actually have nothing to do with you, that it's, it's their own problems, but they're manifesting or, or they're, they're putting them onto you for whatever reason. So that's one thing. Um, that helps me, I guess, cope, particularly when I'm confronted with challenges where people maybe are questioning of, of my work or my ability. I just sort of think to myself, you know, you're ignorant and you probably don't even know you're ignorant, but 
I'm going to present myself in such a way that you are going to realize and feel somewhat ashamed <laughs> that you even had these thoughts. Um, so that's sort of how I approach it. Um, and I guess as, as someone that sort of works within the training space and, and I go into organizations to deliver training, they don't always expect me to rock up looking like what I look like. <laughs> um, my name probably doesn't help as well, it adds to the confusion. Um, my Christian name is Elizabeth, um, which, which is the name that I use, it's my legal name. Um, and my last name, Lang, it, it doesn't, you know, it, I could be a white woman or I could be Asian or <laughs> what have you. Um, so I think, yeah, quite often people, people will present in ways that, that if, if you're not careful, can make you feel really, really bad about yourself and, and lead you down a path of, you know, maybe I shouldn't do this. And I just sort of think to myself, no, it's, it's, it's not my problem and I'm not responsible for, for the ignorance of others, but I'm responsible for how I present um, to that person. And what they do with my presentation is then completely up to them. Uh, in terms of some of the more internal or personal challenges, um, I guess it's just about having a support system in place. Um, I'm really blessed with an amazing, amazing husband. Um, he's very, very supportive of me. And I think, of, I mean, I mean, and times, sometimes opportunities come up and I'll talk about something and I'll be like, oh no, it's not gonna work. And he'll come up with why it will work or why we can make it work or how. Um, so I'm blessed in that sense. And, and I think it makes a huge difference who you're married to, because if, if your life partner is someone that does not, is not supportive of your dreams and you're constantly having to fight or constantly having to, I guess, have these issues where you're, you're always, you're not having any breakthroughs personally. It's, it's very hard on the outside to then be able to go, oh, I can commit to this. Uh, so that's been one huge part of, of it. Um, uh, you know, having someone that's very understanding and very supportive in that sense. Um, and I try not to like, <laughs> I do appreciate it, obviously, but I try not to oversell it because I also feel like that that, that should be an expectation we have of men and of fathers. Um, and I know sometimes, particularly as women of color, sometimes you have different ideas and but but I, I I know that he's he doesn't feel like he's doing anything extra. That's one thing, and I also don't try to <laughs> overemphasize because I also feel like well you know women do that all the time and no one talks women up for being a great mother. Mm. Um, so yes, he's a great dad, but he's he's doing what he feels is his role, um, and I'm grateful for that. Um, and then my broader support network, my mother is also a huge part of my support network. Um, as well as my sister-in-law um, and my brother. So it's when you have children, it's practically speaking, like, you know, this is a working mother as well. You know, you have school drop-offs, you have daycare, you have this and you have that. To, um, and you, you need to be able to have people in your life, I think, to make it work, that, that are supportive, that you can ring up and say, I've got training and I finish at this time. I won't be able to get to the kids by three o'clock. Can you please pick them up? Or can you come early, drop the kids off? Cause I have to be on the road at seven or what have you. Uh, so my personal support network have been, um, I guess my biggest resource. And, and that has really allowed me to be able to do the things that I do. Cause whether I'm working here um, in Perth or whether I, I travel quite a bit as well for work, um, particularly to Melbourne, uh, that would not be possible without the support that I have from those people. Um, you know, because what do I do with two children that have to go to school, that have to be fed and bathed and, and everything else? So, yeah, so that's, that's how I guess I've been able to, to make it work, is, is have a great support network. Um, and, yeah, so know who they are and, and appreciate, I think, the role that, that they play. Because they're... They're a part of my unfolding success. That's right. And right. I would be lying to think that I'm I'm doing this on my own. Not nobody does anything on their yeah, own. Yeah, yeah. And I, I really I get very annoyed by the whole this whole self made concept. It's nonsense. It's, exactly, exactly. You would have you know. There's no way you would have made yourself. There would have been 
thousands and thousands of people um, working behind the scenes to make you or to assist you and support you to become um, you know someone that you to help you with your your goals and and your your aspirations and so it might be in a form of having a supportive um, partner parents or just really having a great supportive network having a great mentor or someone who believes in you and and really gives you that you know energy or the fuel that you need to keep going and so i know we you've talked about having a great um support network what else do you rely on because i know you wear many hats <laughs> You are, you know, a sessional academic. You you serve on on the OAC board. You're a mother, a wife, and I'm sure you're a sister and an auntie. Um, so, how have you managed to maintain a healthy work life balance? <laughs> healthy work life balance. I don't know that I managed to. I think it's a it's an ongoing struggle. Um, <laughs> But I guess I, just being mindful about what you can commit to and what you can realistically do. Um, when I, so if I was to give an example, okay, so I've, and particularly like last year, um, going to the end of last, mid last year, um, or maybe even early last year, I started to re really reevaluate what I was doing and my commitments because I found myself at the point where I had way too much on my plate. Um, and because I genuinely enjoy doing so many things, I have a hard time <laughs> saying no. Um, and I've learned that it's, it's necessary to say more no's uh, because that gets you closer to the right yeses, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so for example, with the teaching, I still teach, but only on a guest lecture basis. I'm not teaching weekly classes anymore. Um, and that's a decision I made a year ago. So for the last two semesters, I haven't taught, um, but I've kept myself open to guest lectures to, to be able to maintain that contact. Cause I really, and it was a tough decision cause I really do enjoy the weekly contact with students and getting to know them. Um, but I absolutely hated the marking and it was just, <laughs> Everybody hates marking. Um, so I guess I, I sort of went through a process where I started to really reevaluate uh, my commitments um, and kept to what I think I could comfortably manage. Um, and I think that that's an important aspect of life in general, regardless of whether you're a mother or, or a father or, or anybody really, is that you have to be able to know what your strengths are and what your limitations are. Um, and you have to be able to say, okay, right, I, I absolutely love to do this, but, in, but I cannot 100% serve this aspect of my life when I've got 10 other things going on. Um, so, but I don't regret teaching for, since for, so I've done it for about four or five years. I don't for a moment regret it because I learned so much from it and I grew tremendously from that experience. Uh, but it got to a point, particularly as I embarked on the PhD and it was taking a, a bit of a back seat, um, I had to make the decision to sort of let that go, but maintain it um, through maybe one or two guest lectures a semester, which for me keeps me happy. Um, I also do training anyway, so I still do have that element um, around education as part of my work. Uh, it's a little bit different when you're uh, training employees to when you're teaching tertiary students, I know that. Um, but yeah, I guess in terms of balance, it's just about constantly evaluating and reevaluating what I'm doing. Um, am I committing to it? If I feel like I'm not giving hundred percent, um, then I have to go, okay, is, is it worth me holding on to this? Cause it, it's not worth, um, you know, giving bits and pieces, I think. Um, um, but I guess with like some of the other commitments such as being on as part of the OAC, when I joined the OAC, I was very honest with the board and I said, this is my situation. Um, I'm a young mother, I've got two young children. Um, I work full time, I'm also um, doing my research. I have a lot on my plate. Um, I'm not gonna lie to you and say that I'm going to come to every single meeting. 
Uh, and particularly, and, and I also gave, I guess, an indication around what I can comfortably work with. I said, I, I've got two young children. If you schedule a meeting at um, five o'clock or even six o'clock, because you think, oh, it's after work, everyone will be free. I won't be free because I will have the children with me. So what I might have to do is you guys go to the meeting um, and I can perhaps dial in and I can have maybe, I can keep my kids occupied for, for 30 or 40 minutes and I'll join by phone. If you want to have a teleconference, uh, please don't schedule it at six o'clock, schedule it at 7.30 because my kids will be in bed and I can 100% then be on board. Um, so I think it's just about being honest and open with people and also not feeling like there's anything wrong with that um, because my biggest responsibility as a mother uh, is that the, the two children that, that I have um, and I have to make sure that whatever I commit to uh, works around that role as, as, as a mother. So yeah, I, I, I would say that it's, it's constantly managing, <laughs> um, but it's just about having honest conversations with people and being aware of what you can realistically do Great advice there. I have taken notes as well myself. <laughs> I've taken some notes and I'll, I'll use some of your, um, your advice. I'll take it on board, especially on uh, not over committing and constantly reevaluating your, your priorities and, and your commitments as well. And so what keeps Elizabeth awake at night? What keeps me awake at night? Um, that's a very open question. I'm just trying to think how to frame this. <laughs> to be honest, it probably goes back to what I said earlier about this notion of just being aware that you only get one life. Um, and I have a responsibility, I think, um, as, a, as an individual to manifest the things that I believe God, God has put in my heart and in my life and um, etc. So I think that, that that's probably it. Um, and when you shared earlier with Miles Monroe, I consume a lot of his content. So when he was, that quote is very familiar to me and it's one that actually comes to mind for me a lot. And, I, and, and I, I don't mean to get morbid, but <laughs> I often have this thought of dying empty. It comes to me all the time. Mm. Um, and I keep asking myself, okay, am I doing the things that I desire to do um, the things that I know are in my heart. Um, and if not, if, if, I'll, if 20, 30, 40, 50 years to pass by, um, I, I sort of think, okay, once I'm 80 or 90 years old, do I want to be sitting down depressed and regretting all the things that I didn't do? Or do I want to be in a space where I go, I've lived so much that I'm, I'm having a checkout. Like I'm, I need a rest now. <laughs> so I think that's what keeps me up at night is that I want to manifest anything, everything I possibly can so that when I get to the end of life, I can happily say that I've run the race and I'm happy to rest. Um, and I think that that should be a motive. I, I think that that is, it's a natural human desire, but sometimes we are conditioned to lose sight of that. Because as human beings, we're very aware of our mortality. And, and it's probably, a, it's a silent driving factor because most of us don't want to confront the reality of the fact that there will come a day when you, you won't be around anymore. Um, but I think society and, and culture conditions us to go, oh no, we don't talk about death, that's a very typical topic, we, we, we don't go there. You just, just pretend like you'll be here forever. But I, I don't want to be 80 years old and, and, and bitter and, you know, I don't. I want to tell exactly. stories. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and that's, that's really great. And what you've just said there, because most of the time we think of legacy as something that's going to happen at the end of your life. But I strongly believe that legacy is built every single day. Yes. Every single day you are alive, you're building your legacy. And so legacy is not something that we wait for until the end of our life or assignment here on earth, but it's something that we uh, build every day. And for you, this is the legacy you're building, you know, mm -hmm. um, that you living a selfless life and you intend to die empty. Mm. Mm, mm, wonderful. As we're coming to um, a close in terms of, you know, 
this interview, we are winding it um, up. I've got some funny questions to ask you so that we can get to know you a little bit more. I call it take three. And so where you talk about three things um, that you, we, 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 you can respond to. Um, the first question being, if you end up being stranded on an island and you're only allowed three people to visit you, who will be these three people and why? That's a very tough question. Can I just say that first? <laughs> I know. Just for everybody else that will be watching this video. No, That's you're not. Off, you're not gonna offend anyone. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> but to be completely honest, yeah, I guess um, being a wife and a mother, um, that is the biggest thing for me. So it would be my husband and my two children. Oh. And I'm only lucky that at the moment I have two because if I had three or more, <laughs> that would be difficult. I, I couldn't separate the kids. <laughs> the answer might be a bit different. Yeah. Um, but yeah. But then I tell them to bring me lots of pictures and videos of my family and everybody else. Oh, you're very, you're cheating me. <laughs> but that's, that's very wise of you. <laughs> and how about the three places you would like to visit? I know you are a traveler. You love traveling. And so, yeah, it will be interesting to know. I love traveling, but honestly, I haven't traveled that much. Um, I've been to a few places, like I've been... I mean, I've only been to one place in Europe, that's Switzerland, um, Africa, and um, parts of Asia. Uh, so I haven't traveled as much, but it's obviously something that I wanted to do more, particularly now as my kids get older. Three places I'd like to go. Um, now, this is the first place. It's, it's a continent rather than a country. Um, I have a huge dream of wanting to travel around the African continent. Um, it's something that I've had for the longest of time. I've been to a few places, like I've obviously Sud um, Sudan, where I was born, um, South Sudan, where um, my I'm we're originally from, but I visited for the first time in 2009, and then I went for the second time a few years ago. Um, Tanzania, um, uh, Uganda, and um, South Africa. But I really, really want to travel around the African continent. Um, not as a typical tourist. I, I just want to travel as an African woman that genuinely wants to learn by being immersed in the different communities around the continent. Because I think that the African continent offers so much richness of history and culture. Yes. Um, and obviously it's a huge part of my identity as, mm -hmm. as, a, as an African woman, but also it's the cradle of life, that it's, it's where civilization began. So even that in itself, if I was to remove the connection as an African, um it's it's so significant for me so i know that that obviously you know there's 54 countries there africa's not it's not a country it's a continent but i do want to travel around the continent that that's a huge dream of mine um the other place i want to travel to um it's not so much it's probably more because of my husband than it is me personally it's the united states because he spent um 10 years in the u.s um and it's, it's, he keeps talking about wanting to go back and wanting to take the kids, et cetera. Um, and obviously the general, you know, the, the amusement parks, et cetera. Um, so I, I do want to visit to see where he lived and where he studied. And um, yes, and, and I think it'll, it'll be great for the children as well. Um, it's probably not, I mean, I think, it, yeah, it, it's probably more because of my husband's connection. Um, my biggest desire is obviously the African continent, but I'd love to visit the US. But, um, also, America is a very interesting place because obviously um, as, as sort of the most what, powerful country, in, as, as they say, in the world. But, but I think not, not even that, just how much influence the United States has universally in terms of um, other countries, but also in terms of culture universally, mm, mm. Uh, I think it's an interesting place. And I think America is very diverse as well. Um, so I'd like to get to know a little bit more of the side of the US that is beyond what we see in the news. That's right. Um, so that would be interesting. The third place I'd like to visit. Um, ooh, where would that be? It's funny because, you know, I, I live in Australia, right? But 
how much how many of us living in australia have explored australia <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> um, and this is not even going on a plane. Like I've, for the last two years, I've always been like, oh, I really want to travel around WA. Because WA in itself has so much to offer both North and, and South. Um, so I, I actually don't want to, I don't want to not travel around Australia. And then, because there may be a day when, I, you know, a time in the future that I'm living in overseas and people go, oh, what's, What's his mania like? And I'm like, oh, I, I've never been there. <laughs> um, so, so eventually I'd love to travel. Um, I've been to most of the states. Um, yeah, I think I, I haven't been to Tasmania. I haven't been to Darwin, but I've been everywhere else. But I'd really love to travel also regional WA. I've done so a little bit through my work, and it's always been very interesting because um, they're not very diverse communities. <laughs> um, so you go down to the local coals or the local Woolies after, after work and people look at you like, where is she coming from? <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, it's, it's, there's, there's some amazing places that are so different to the city of Perth around mm -hmm. Western Australia. Um, so yeah, I, I, I need to be able to tell other people when I travel <laughs> what Australia is like without saying, oh yeah, I've spent most of my life there, but I've, I don't know much other than Perth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, we we learn a lot through traveling. We do. Traveling opens up, you know, doors and opportunities for us to learn. Um, if you're that person who is always uh, lived in your own environment, familiar environment, you've never bothered to travel. You really, I think you're you're um, you're limited to what you can yeah. say about other people and in their culture because you you don't know that much what we see on television is not everything no yeah <laughs> oh and 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 in terms of reading i know you're an avid reader what was the last book you read last book i read um uh, i've got a few at the moment the main one uh well this one i've consumed a number of times via audio um and that is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, a classic. I love, I love that book. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's one that, that's the last one that I consumed, I think, in its totality um, by audio. Because I also find that it's, it's, over the years, it's become harder and harder for me to sit down with a book and read. Um, either because it's usually the end of the day, I'm exhausted, I've, I've put the kids in bed, then I've done some housework, and, and I'm just, tired um and i might even be sitting there reading a book and i'm reading it but it's not even registering <laughs> um so i've i've taken on to consuming audio books now and i find that i actually because i i'm always on the road driving obviously um to work etc picking up the kids it's just it it's made life a lot easier for me and it, and it's made it possible for me to be able to maintain i know it's not reading um but consume content um mm. in terms of books that, that i've wanted to um another one is uh there's a few books that are sort of on my radar at the moment um the 10x rule mm. by um, oh god and his name's just escaped me grant cardone oh, wow um, so but i haven't I've, i haven't gotten very far yet with that um but yeah, there's a few books while we're on books that I would like to share in terms of my favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is The Magic of Belief, I think it's called. Oh, wow. You know, you are giving me um, a few ideas there. Books that I yeah. should be putting on my to-read list for this year. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, there's some amazing ones out there. Yeah, The Magic of Belief was just amazing. It's, it's got a similar flavor to Think and Grow Rich, but it, it's, it, it focuses obviously on, on belief, but it really, it makes so much sense. And, and I think it made me appreciate, I've always known that obviously that there's power in belief, but it just gave you so many tangible examples of how belief is actually powerful and how it, it, it translates into reality because Everything always starts as an idea, right? Be before it becomes something tangible. Yes. So that's an amazing book. I highly recommend it. Um, and then there's another one by Susan Jeffers called 
feel the fear and do it anyways. Uh, it's a it's a very small book, um, and it's on. Uh, there's a free one on on YouTube. I think that's how I continue as well. It was an amazing book. Do you mind repeating the title of it again? It's called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyways. All right, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyways. And it's on YouTube. It's a free. It's a free audio on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, an amazing book, quite quick to to listen to as well, because the actual physical book is quite small. Right. Um, but it's one that you can listen to a million times, and I've 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 never not picked up something new. It just it really dissects the concept of fear and how it works, and how it's an illusion, and how by moving towards your fears is is how we can effectively address them. Because sometimes I think we go, oh no, I'm it's too scary, so I won't do it. You, you'll never get to a point in life where, where you're 100% fearless. True. But if you live on the side of fear, then you never do anything as well. Yes, yes, so, you are. Yeah. Wow, wow. And then looking at your, and I would really love to keep talking and talking to you because you're <laughs> such, um, you know, you're this world, you know, world of knowledge and, and, and energy and information and you, you, you really, um, you're, you're such a social impactor and an influencer as well. And uh, I respect that from you. You leave the talk. You just don't talk. You leave it as well. Um, but yeah, because of our time, in the interest of our um, you know, time, the last, again, we are still doing our take three. What are the three things, looking at your journey so far, what are the three things you're grateful for? Three things I'm grateful for. Um, I'm grateful for, for, for the gift of life in general, because I believe that life is a gift, um, and for it to have been granted unto me until this point. Um, I'm also grateful, uh, I guess it's, I don't know, I guess it is something I'm grateful for, but it's obviously part of who I am. It's my faith, because it's been a huge... It's even funny to say it's a huge part of me. I just feel like it's who I am. <laughs> Not a part of me, it's just who I am. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's guided my life in, in so many ways. And, you know, we could talk for hours about different things. Um, but faith is a huge, faith is everything. It's not a huge part of it. It's, it's everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my compass, I say. <laughs> yeah, I like that. It's my compass, exactly. Uh, and... I guess the third one, and this is very broad and I'm probably cheating, but it's just family. Um, you know, the gift of family, of relationships. Um, when I say family, obviously my husband and children, but also my parents, my siblings, uh, because they're a huge part of who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. I was actually thinking when you said things, um, you said, did you say three people I was grateful for or three things I was grateful for? Oh, three things I'm grateful for. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely my family. I, 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 it just, I just had a sort of a something come to mind uh, from childhood was uh, growing up because I, I mentioned earlier that I, I obviously learned English um, here. It was interesting because I remember when I first started, well, when we first arrived, it started in year four um, in primary school, but I did like two weeks of it because we came in November. So you know, it was like two weeks of Christmas cards. Mm. <laughs> that was year four for me. Mm. Um, and then I went into year five. But I remember my older brother, the amount of times I would go to him to just explain basic concepts. Because um, even though I did English as a subject before we arrived, it, it's not the same as living in the country, right? Yes. Um, so just for the support that I've had that to boost up, I guess, my literacy, to, to the degree where I could catch up to my peers is a huge part. I sort of look at that and I think that was what, at the age of 10, trying to pick up or, or you know, the, the years of literacy that I'd missed not having, having studied in an education system that is very different to an Australian education system where English was just a subject and, and there was the, the focal language was actually something else. Um, to now doing a PhD, it really started in those days where I was trying to learn how to read and write and how to make sense 
of sentences on how to structure sentences. That is the beginning of my PhD journey. And I think people go, oh, you know, you're, you're here, you're doing this. Yes, it's great that I'm doing that. But without that support that I had from my brother to try and understand English, to even read my homework and make sense of what I was reading, there's no way I'd get to a level where I'm doing a PhD or even teaching at a tertiary level where I'm teaching other university students. Um, so I never lose sight um, of my beginnings. I think it, it keeps me grounded because it's important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. Always remember where you've come from. That's a very, very important, um, I think, statement or mantra to live by. Mm. Always being appreciative and grateful for your beginning. And, exactly. and and being, you know, never despising the days of humble beginnings. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. uh, you know, Elizabeth, it's been such a joy um, having you on this program. You and I can, you know, keep talking and we can go on and on because we, I think in a way, we, we've got so many things in common, very similar in terms of how we, we, we operate and even how we look at life and and in terms of aspirations as well and thank you very much so because of our time we need to wind this um up but um i would like to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for availing yourself um to be able to share your story and your life with our audience here our viewers and listeners and and I'm sure there are many people who have been inspired by your story and I personally have learned um, quite a few things from this interview some of the tips and um, you know nuggets you have shared with with us and I'm going to take that on board uh, and they're going to help me to become better <laughs> so thank you thank you very much for your time Thank you for your time. Can I also thank you for creating this platform? Because I think it's so important. Um, and I think that there's not enough initiatives like this. So for me, it's truly an honor to be a part of it. And I hope that what I've shared is of value to your listeners and your audience. Um, and yeah, I, I support you 100%. Um, I look forward to also being um, as part of the audience myself, I guess, with the speakers that you've had in the past, but also ongoing so yeah it's you're, you're doing amazing work thank you oh, thank you thank you very much <laughs> <laughs>